So I am only physically writing a single project at a time. And then when I'm finished with that project, the next project, what I always do is figure out what I call the giggle test. The next project must pass the giggle test. It must be the project that is gonna make me giggle the most because it is so much easier to go to the keyboard when you're excited about a project rather than having to have discipline and force yourself to go to the keyboard every day. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 120 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have an interview with Leah Cutter. Leah writes page-turning, wildly imaginative fiction set in exotic locations such as a magical New Orleans, the ancient Orient, rural Kentucky, Seattle, Minneapolis, and many others. She writes fantasy, science fiction, mystery, literary, and horror fiction. Her short fiction has been published in magazines like Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine and Tailbones, anthologies like Fiction River, where I've had the privilege of selecting her fiction for her stories, uh, anthologies I have edited, as well as on the web. Leah's long fiction has been published both by New York publishers as well as small presses. And we're going to get to a conversation that we recently had. Not in person, unfortunately. It's, uh, it'll be a while, I guess, since I see her. It was, it was too bad. I, I would see Leah regularly in person over the last couple of years, but it may be a while before I get to see her in person. But I did get a chance to kind of hang out with her at a Starbucks because that's where she was sitting when I interviewed her most recently for this podcast. But before we get into the interview, I'm going to do a very brief personal update and then uh, read a word from this episode's sponsor, Find Away Voices. <music> This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows authors the ability to get their audiobooks out into a broad market. 43 and counting, there may be more than 43 at this point, retail and library markets where you can publish your audiobook to. That includes the major platforms that you're probably familiar with, such as Audible and Apple, but it includes so many other retailers that include Barnes & Noble and Kobo and Google, as well as multiple library channels. Now, I've had some amazing success publishing short fiction using Findaway Voices, and they have so many varieties of programs that they offer. You can upload your own professionally produced audio product yourself and set the price at virtually every one of the retail markets except for one. And you can also find a narrator to work with. And they even have a Voices Share program that allows you to do a combo royalty splitting program where you're paying 50% of the regular rate. And it doesn't lock you into exclusivity with a single retailer. It allows you to publish broadly to all the places. If you want to check out how you can leverage Findaway Voices as a small publisher or as an independent author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. In terms of a personal update, I am just about preparing to head on to Las Vegas where I'm going to be with Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush and a bunch of other amazing editors as part of the WMG Fiction Anthology Workshop. It's a fantastic live workshop. I've been an editor for for many years. I get to read over a million words of different stories from some amazingly talented writers. And what we get to do is we get to critique these stories live on stage. It's a very long, stressful week. There's a lot of laughter. There's a lot of tears. There's a lot of mixed emotions. But it's a really amazing experience because you get to show writers that it's not necessarily that the story isn't good. It's that it didn't work for that particular editor. Because you have six editors on stage arguing 
about a story. One of them loves it, one of them hates it, one of them couldn't read it, one of them hated this one character, this one, the way it ended, and the other one loved it and wouldn't change a word. It's just a really great eye-opening experience for writers to realize not everyone is your target audience, and I love doing that. It's more a traditional um, way of looking at publishing in terms of editors, but when you think about an editor, an editor is really just a reader, and in the case of curated material and traditional publishing, the editor is the curator who decides whether or not they're going to purchase a novel or a story for publication. But at the end of the day, they're really just a reader. And if you're self-publishing, well, there's different reactions from readers. And so it really uh, helps thicken the skin to be sitting in a room with 60 other writers and, and actually to have editors critique your story live. A very emotional thing, but uh, I, I love the experience because I really feel personally connected to the writers. And one of the interesting things that happens is as I'm reading the stories, I don't actually attend to who the writer is. I just look at the title of the story. I read the story. I make my notes. And then when I'm when I'm talking about the story, I come back to my notes and I look and I see the name of the person. And then I look and I, and I, I look them in the eyes when I'm telling them the story. And um, it's kind of funny. I'm like, oh, cool. You wrote that story because I, I never really put the two to, to, together until I'm there. So it's always a really, really good experience. The only other thing I wanted to share this particular week is I um, in the continuing uh, sum summation of my 2019 uh, income from uh, writing, etc. I believe I shared one early on in the year, but what I didn't do is I didn't break down my writing income into uh, how much of it came from different sources. So here's how 2019 broke out when I divided up the sources. 64.97% of my income from 2019 for writing came from self-published titles. Let's round that up to 65%. 15% of my writing income in 2019 came from traditional publishing, where somebody actually paid me money up front, either in advance or royalties on uh, traditional publishing projects. And 20% the, the remainder was sort of a mixture of self and traditional. So that's a combination of would be when I purchased uh, copies of my own books, whether I've self-published them or I purchased them from one of my publishers to resell at uh, venues, uh, usually in-person venues. That's, that's what I count as mixed self and traditional. So interesting year. It's often been a 60-40 split, uh, typically between self-publishing and traditional publishing. In this particular case, traditional publishing uh, revenue went down significantly which is uh, interesting, and, and more of the hybrid stuff, where uh, the money I earned wasn't necessarily directly from traditional publishing, but a, a combination of trad and self, and, and self-publishing at 65% of my income. So again, it's just an illustration to writers of the uh, different revenue sources, the different streams. I think I talked about the revenue sources last time as within self-publishing Here's where uh, my money came from. And I was really, really pleased that I think Amazon was below 50% of my income for 2019, meaning I made more of my writing income from uh, other sources, uh, a variety of retail and library sources. So again, that's just something that I'm always fascinated to track, and I thought I would want to share that with you. But that's it for my personal update and the introductory ramblings. Let's get on to this interview with Leah Cutter. Hey, Leah, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Hi. So uh, you're hanging out at a, a Starbucks? Is it in I your neighborhood? I am hanging out at a Starbucks. We don't have good internet back at the farm. And so I am using somebody else's internet for doing this. Okay. So I have to ask, is this a Starbucks? Uh, are you a writer who goes out into cafes? Is this a place that you frequent to do some writing? Every once in a while. Generally, I, I go out to a coffee shop to write when I'm having difficulty concentrating. Okay. Because there's just enough white noise in the background of a coffee shop to keep me focused. So other than, uh, other than uh, the, maybe this particular Starbucks or a coffee shop in general, is there, is there a preferred place for you, where you, uh, your ideal spot for writing? Yes, and that is in my tiny house. T I live in a tiny house on six and a half acres of, of woodlands in Ravensdale, Washington. Okay. So we have the main house, which is about 1,100 square feet, okay. uh, which is where my husband lives. And then I built myself a tiny house, which is 296 square feet. <laughs> I didn't realize it was that small. I've seen pictures, but wow. Yeah, it is that small. Uh, and I stayed there Monday through Friday with the kitty. 
And then on the weekends, I go and I live in the main house with my husband. Because while I love my husband, and he is the, the love of my life, I never have to move in with him. Wow. Uh, so is this kind of like, uh, it's a work week, I'm focusing on the on the writing yes. through Monday through Friday, and then Saturday, Sunday, you guys are like hanging out together doing your thing? Yes, exactly. So you're both very, very prolific writers. You're both Correct. producing a ton of material. Does that it does that actually ease in the process because you're not distracted by this handsome man all the time exactly okay. exactly right. i'm not distracted by the handsome man he's not distracted by the beautiful woman of course that would that goes without saying yes yes um so that that's actually fascinating so um how long i want to i want to kind of take it back we've talked about the small house okay. we've talked about writing in cafes <laughs> I, I, since i've known you you've been a writer but how long have mm -hmm. you actually been when did you first get into writing when i was eight years old Really? I have my very first journal from when I was eight years old. And it says on the very first page, second paragraph, first sentence, when I grow up, I want to be a writer. Oh, and you so still have that? I, yes. And I do not remember a time in my life when I did not want to be a writer, when I did not want to support myself telling stories. Wow. So hang on. Uh, so it, your small house... Does the small house have bookshelves and a library or is that in the main house? Is that... It has a few. Okay. It has a, a few books and those rotate depending on what book it is that I'm currently writing and what I need for research material that's, okay. that's right at hand. Uh, so I just, uh, so last year I finished a, a four book series. Um, that's the witch's progress where Tara, her, the magic system is based on herbs and plants and things like that. So I had a lot of magic herbal books that okay. I was frequently referring to. Uh, now I'm doing a serial killer or a serial rapist. Um, <laughs> so I have, I have other books that I'm looking up on a regular basis. So um, the other thing I know about you is you don't just obviously stick to one genre. You obviously are, are moving about how, and you have a lot of different things on the go at the same time. How do you move from uh, one project to another? How does that, like, you, you know, you divide your week up, the, the week and then the weekends and stuff like that for physical where you're living. But um, how do you divide up your writing? Do you do something similar there? No, no. I, so the, the only similar thing would be that I only write on one project at a time. Okay. I do not write on more than one project at a time. I might be doing research okay. for more than one project at a time, but I am only physically writing a single project at a time. And then when I'm finished with that project, uh, the next project, what I always do is figure out what I call the giggle test. The next project must pass the giggle test. It must be the project that is going to make me giggle the most because it is so much easier to go to the keyboard when you're excited about a project rather than having to have discipline and force yourself to go to the keyboard every day. So you're giggling the way I giggle when I find a new beer I haven't had and I'm excited and thrilled to try it, exactly. not giggling because it's so silly. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. Exactly. Though sometimes it is that silly. Well, yes, of course. Some of the I some of the stuff you've writing, written. Yes. 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 I'm currently writing a short story, and it and it starts off with her uh, talking about how how since her brother became a a bird god, she has to leave the kitchen window open on a regular basis. Wow. Okay. That is that is a <laughs> dilemma. That <laughs> But then the next one, seriously, we're talking about a serial rapist. It'll be awesome. Yeah, but you giggle when you approach the serial rapist, too, because you're excited well, to write about it. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It may be maniacal uh, cackling, depending on the body count. Um, but there's always excitement. That is one of the... I, I cannot write something that I am not excited about. And that really helps me narrow down which project I want to work on. Because, of course, there are 14 million ideas and things that I want to write about at this time. Which one takes highest link, highest priority? That one makes me giggle. There you go. Wow, I love that. That is fantastic. So again, if I were to throw out the question of right to market versus right what you're passionate about, I'm, I'm, I suspect <laughs> I know what camp you're going to be sitting in, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. The, the only kind of quote market, unquote, that I would say that my fiction writing goes to is that I... I consider myself a traveler. 
an explorer. That's okay. what my that's what my my tagline on my website is is writer traveler. And so there is always going to be some element of travel, of exploration, of finding finding weird shit. Um, in you know fairies in the corner of the gardens that sort of thing and so if there was any sort of right to market it's i might be writing along and saying "Ooh, we haven't moved yet we need to travel okay wow oh really that that's fascinating i never uh actually when i when i think back to the the fiction of yours that i've read i'm i'm suspecting yeah there there is or there's a quest or there's travel or, yep. yeah okay all right yep. that makes sense so just for my listeners, just to get a feel for the, the various genres that, I mean, is there a genre you haven't played in? Like, which, what are the ones that you're most writing in most often? I'm most writing in fantasy, but it's all the different subgenres of fantasy. Okay. So uh, epic dark fantasy, that's the, the three novels that are coming out in March, April, and May. Okay. Uh, historic fantasy, that's the, that was where I got my start with Paper Mage, which is set in the Tong Dynasty. Um, I do contemporary fantasy. I do urban fantasy. Uh, contemporary fantasy would be all the Franklin, Franklin story, Franklin, Franklin versus the popcorn thief. Okay. Then I have all the contemporary fantasy, which would be the Terra stories that I just finished, which is, which is progress or like that. But I also, in addition to all the fantasy, I also write science fiction. Yeah. Uh, so I have two novels that, that just, well, one novel that just came out, one novel that's just about to come out that are science fantasy. The first one is hard science fiction. You are dealing with somebody who is on the Mars colony okay. and is worried about breaches from space and like that. But at the same time, he's a wizard oh, wow. or a warlock. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm doing that kind of combination. But I also, when I tend to write science fiction, it tends to be hard science fiction. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of, of research and science. And by research, I mean research, because one of the things I do for fun is I go read science articles. Okay. Wow. I'm a geek. Yes. But I also write horror. Not a lot of it, but I have some horror. Okay. Uh, and, some, and some people say that's some of my best stuff that I've ever done. Wow. Um, and I do straight literary and I do mystery. I do a lot of mystery and that's what I'm moving a lot into. So besides the fantasy, the second biggest thing I think would be mystery. Okay. Wow. And, um, just, just to get a sense for what you're, what you're producing, like how many, how many products do you end up releasing in a given 12 month period? So I am on what is called the Amazon pulse. Okay. So once a month, every month, for the last three and a half years, I have published something. Okay, wow. On the 21st of the month. Not all of those have been novels. Some of them have been novellas, some of them have been collections, some of them have been short stories, but I write enough that I am producing something once a month, every month. So at least 12 uh, things year, a year then. 12 things a year at the very least. This year, most of those will be novels. Okay, wow. And then given, um, given that you write uh, short stories, you write novellas, you write novels, when you get an idea, because you've got a bazillion of them floating around in your head, mm -hmm. do you know that that idea is for a story or for a long, like a novella or a novel length work? Or does it, does it tell you as you're, as you're writing it? Or is it all planned out in advance? Most of the time, I know what the length of a story is okay. when, I, when I start it. It's like, oh, yeah, this is 7,000 words. Okay. This one is only 3,000 words. This, holy f this is a novel. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's just going to depend. Every once in a while, I get tricked. Really? Writer brain lies to me. Yes, <laughs> yes, most recently. Last week, even, I started a short story that I was certain was going to be a short story. And then I started going into it and going into it. No, it's a novel. <laughs> So I had to put that aside because I have two, sh I have three short stories that are due to various markets and like that uh, by March 1st. So yeah, you, you I, had, I had to, to stop. put that one to yeah. the side, <laughs> start the next short story, which I finished yesterday, uh, started a new short story today, which I'll finish tomorrow. Maybe. No, I have got an early meeting tomorrow, which I'll finish Wednesday. Yeah. And then I'll finish the next short story sometime this week. Wow. And then I'll start the next novel, hopefully by Monday. Hopefully. <laughs> so do you have a, a, a spreadsheet where you're tracking the projects that you know are coming next? Like, so you can prioritize them? How do you, how do you? That do would that? be smart. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really smart if I did that. I, I have 
a lot of systems in place for keeping track of the publishing, not so much keeping track of the writing. Oh, really? And yet you're yeah. still producing at that high rate. Yes. So it falls together somehow. Yep, exactly. <laughs> there, I do have my Google Calendar where I keep most of my publishing, most of my writing dates. Okay. Do. But I don't want to look at that often because that puts too much pressure on the writing. I'm, I'm very much a free spirit. Okay. So do you, do you leave the editor and you leave the business person outside of the room and you just go yes. to town on the writing? Okay. Exactly. So I have a separate writing computer. I have a separate writing desk. Even in the tiny house. Really? I have a separate writing desk. Yes. So the tiny house is only 290 square, 296 square feet. Uh, that's the footprint. But it's tall enough that I have a loft. Okay. So up on the loft, I have a little standing desk uh, where I write. Uh, with a separate computer. And then downstairs, I have my production desk. Wow. And a production computer. And so you, you, your body is, is trained to say, I'm in this space, I'm going to be all business. I'm in this space, I'm going to be all creative spirit. Yes. Wow. And, and that works well for you. What, what, when you go to Starbucks, is, is it mostly creative spirit or does the business yes. person sneak? Well, I know the business person's sneaking in today, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mostly. But again, it, it's the computer. I have trained oh, myself. Okay. I opened the, the, the one computer. So I learned how to type on my grandfather's uh, manual typewriter. Okay. I have never figured, I have never trained myself how to not pound on the keys. Even if it's a gentle keyboard. Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I destroy computers. This writing computer has lasted longer than any of my other ones because it's a kid's computer. Oh, really? That's been refurbished. It's all plastic. <laughs> Really? And it's, it was, yes, and it was built to be beat on. Wow. So it has nothing on it. It has Word. It has Excel. That's it. Really? So no internet? No internet. It has no internet capabilities. Oh, that's, that's, that's brilliant. So you can't get distracted. So, so, so what happens? You're in the middle of a scene. And you need to research something. There's an herb that you need to use. And you're yep. like, oh, I got to look that up. How do you deal with that without like having to put it down and go find your book? And what, what I will frequently do is I'll look something up on my phone, which I find annoying um, because, you know, it's that little tiny screen and I'm trying to scroll right. and, oh, okay, I, I got my information and I'll put it down because it's just, it's, it's so much of a pain. Okay. So it's quick uh, in and out. You don't get, uh, oh, look, a cat video and you're off. To, okay. Yep. All right. I, I can't look at any videos. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. That's really, really cool. Now I want to bring the business person back into the conversation because you have this 14 book, well, currently 14 books, maybe 15 books by the time people hear this, but you have 14 books in a series called business for breakfast. Mm -hmm. What's the origin of that? Where did that come from? So back in 2013, I took a, a master business workshop from Christine Catherine Rouge and Dean Wesley Smith. And at that point, I learned that I, that while I thought I knew a lot about business, I knew nothing. Okay. So I went ahead and I bought those big tomes, uh, you know, incorporate yourself and small business taxes and deduct it and all of those things. Yeah. And these things are guaranteed to, to produce, to cure insomnia. Okay. I mean, they're <laughs> so dry. They are so dull. So what I did was I, I, I put them on my, on my table where I ate and every morning while I was eating my breakfast, I would go through and I would read and I would teach myself about business. Okay. And so that kind of was the origin of business for breakfast. All of the chapters in business for breakfast are purposely written short and fast so that you can consume them while consuming your meal. Oh my God. So this is, these are, these are meant to just say, okay, every morning I'm going to di uh, digest, I'm going to consume yep. <laughs> one of the chapters so I can digest it over the day to follow the exactly. analogy. Okay. Exactly. And then the next day. Oh, really? Okay. That's, that's really, really cool. So it, uh, it orig originated when you were eating breakfast while consuming content. And then what you were doing is you're creating a, a, a more interesting, more digestible version of, exactly. of the business lessons that you were learning. For other exactly. Be, uh, because my books are purposefully written for artists. They are not written for those stupid MBAs who are lying to you okay. about how to run a business and everything like that. I have looked, I have read so many business books and they are, they are so difficult 
to digest, right. as it were, because I am an artist. Okay. I have enough of a business sense that I can that I can do that translation. Uh, but they're they're really just a pain. So no, I wrote specifically for the artist, specifically for somebody who does not have an MBA, specifically for somebody who looks at a spreadsheet and calls it a spreadsheet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when you is there a particular order? Um, people are, are they recommended to read them in order, like books one through 14, or how does that? Not necessarily, no. They're, each book, for the most part, is discrete okay. and covers a, a discrete topic. Now, some of the books are craft books, some of the books are publishing books, and some of the books are more of what we call life coaching sorts of things. Okay. So the, the business books are the beginning professional publisher. You are just new to indie publishing. Here are some of the things that you want to look at. Okay. okay. Uh, you are just starting to write the beginning professional publisher, uh, the okay. beginning professional writer. Okay. Um, there are also craft books such as uh, the beginning professional storyteller, which covers the seven point plot structure and goes through it step by step to, to talk you through it. But then there are more advanced books as well, like the intermediate marketing or beginning marketing. <laughs> right. Intermediate marketing is coming out later this year. Okay. Uh, so those are, those are business books. And then, and then lifestyle books, uh, the healthy writer. Right. Okay. And growing as an artist. Okay. And probably later on this year, I've already started it, is the author branding book, which is honestly going to be as much craft, business, and <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> of course. Now, this is a series that you, uh, you've uh, co-authored some uh, with your husband, but um, has he uh, done some he of them as well? Some, I write some. Okay. We don't write them together. Oh, no. Okay. So they're completely separate. They're not co-authored. So if, if Blaze is... Uh, on it, then he's written the book. Uh, yes. Okay, so it's a, but it's still a, it's still a, uh, a Leah R. Cutter sort of a mm -hmm. brand. It's that yep. uh, your brand. He's just sort of a guest writer on. <laughs> exactly. Of, because exactly. that's pr that's probably some of his expertise, right? Yes. Like yes. Okay. So, for example, he uh, used to uh, write screenplays. Okay. Uh, and he's quite good at writing screenplays and, and uh, stage plays and things like that. And so he wrote the book uh, for the um, three-act structure okay. for right. writers. Okay. So breaking out how do you apply the three-act structure to a fiction piece. Okay. All right. Cool. And then I think he did like um, a magazine, book on magazines as well. Yes, because a book of on this... how to create a magazine because he has right. a magazine called uh, Boundary Shock Quarterly, which is a quarterly science fiction magazine that is now going into its third year, Wow. which is rather amazing. Yes. And it continues to sell, which we're all surprised at, but it's good. So, um, so and this is interesting because, uh, so Blaze's magazine is going into its third year. You're in your third year of the producing at least uh, one uh, project a month. Was, was, was there a friendly competition between the two of you or did you both come to the same thing, uh, same sort of um, determination at the same time? How did, how did that, how did that work? Was it a, hey, I'm going to do... Determination about what? A, 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 a combination of coming to the determination of saying, we are going to produce a lot of content. We're going to be putting something out once a month. Did that happen at the same time? Did you inspire him? Did he inspire you? Was it a two-way street? How did that, how did that work out? We, we were actually at another master business publishing class. And this was the one that he attended when we learned about the Amazon Pulse. Okay. So by publishing something once a month uh, and having Amazon as one of our distributors, uh, they do a lot of our advertising for us. Okay. So they will send out an email two weeks before a major book gets released. And by major book, it means we have had a lot of pre-orders for it. Right. Amazon will send out a book I will send out an email to everyone who has followed that author and say, Hey, did you know Blaze Ward has a book coming in the next two weeks? Okay. And then two weeks after it's published, they go, Hey, did you know Blaze Ward had a book come out? <laughs> because we're on that pulse, we get those emails regularly, okay. even for, for some of the non-important things. When we were not on that pulse, Amazon would bunch them up and would say, hey, they released all of this stuff over the last six months and, <laughs> and like that. But by staying there consistently, they do a lot of our advertising for us. In addition, we both think that we have higher author ranking because of that consistent publishing. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. So, so we came up with this once we learned about the Amazon Pulse and we said, okay, let's do this. 
Okay. And so we both said, all right, put our heads down. We're, we're going to work. We're going to do this. Wow. Wow. So um, the other thing uh, that you made me think about was um, you're not publishing exclusively to Amazon. This Correct. is just, this is leveraging Amazon the way you want to leverage Amazon, but you're also publishing your books to most of the other major retailer and library markets. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, so we publish direct to Kobo, to draft to digital and to iTunes. And then I use draft to digital to get into all the other distributors and uh, library systems and, and, and stuff library like that systems exactly. as well. Now you talked about Amazon sending out these emails to customers and stuff like that. And that's one thing that you've been very passionate about as well is you've been very passionate about regularly communicating with your fans because uh -huh. you know, you've got the pulse going on, you got lots of material going out and then you've got a way. So, um, Tell us a little bit about the newsletter. I love, I love the story about your newsletter, but uh, tell us a little, because you kind of have, kind of have yes. two flavors, right? I have, I have two flavors of newsletters. So I took uh, Amy, and I'm going to butcher her last, Tammy, I'm going to butcher her last name, LaBruc or something Tammy like LeBrec? that. Tammy LaBruc? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes, I took her newsletter Ninja. Yes. Uh, course, yeah. which was fabulous, and I recommend everybody to take it. And she taught me that you don't just uh, have asks in your newsletter. You're not always asking people to buy your books. In addition, you have gives. And so I try to maintain a 50% give to ask ratio, okay. so, which is why I have two newsletters. One newsletter, which is the chatty newsletter, is just chatty. It's just talking about, well, this is what's going out on the farm. And, oh, yeah, we had a herd of elk come through the other night. Yeah. And these are what, this is what I'm growing. And here are some of the herbs that are currently coming up. And, oh, my God, I've got beautiful daffodils just about to, to bloom. And it'll be fabulous. Um, and I also have a cool link to something I've read because I'm constantly reading nonfiction sorts of articles. Right. So there's a, there was a fascinating thing that uh, somebody recently did where they took ancient, uh, well-known portraits of people and then said, this is what this person would look like in modern day. Oh, wow. With a modern haircut <laughs> or a modern suit okay. or something like that. It's absolutely fascinating. And so that's the kind of link that I'll put in there. Or I'll put in, um, I just recently did a bunch of research about comets. And so comets are not actually ice balls. They're actually dust balls. And so this is changing how we view um, future space life because we'd always considered that, okay, we're going to need water wherever we go. Right. How are we going to get it? Well, we're going to go in and get us some comets. Well, what if they're not completely composed of ice? And so that sort of thing. Um, I, I, so always a cool link. In addition, I have... I talk about whatever it is that I'm reading recently because I'm always reading something. Okay. Um, and I always have a link to somebody else's book and I talk a little bit about my writing and then that's it. That's about it. And I leave them with pictures of my kitty yeah. and maybe pictures of the elk or deer or whatever is crossing through the yard recently. Okay. So that's the chatty newsletter. Then I have the, the somewhat chatty newsletter that is not as chatty okay. and it contains information about whatever is getting released that month. Okay. So one of them is them. So it, the, I imagine you have some engagement. Um, of, yes. Right. Yes. I get emails back from every single newsletter, which is fun. Okay. Uh, so I have, I have some people like there are two or three people who will email me every time I send out a newsletter in response. <laughs> Really? So that's, and that's the kind of engagement you, you want to have with your readers, right? Where you exactly. can interact with them. And so, uh, so, so that's what, uh, you send one mid month and one at the end of the month or? or is that... I send one on the fifth of every month and one on the 21st. My, the release date that I have is the 21st. So I always send out a newsletter on the 21st. On month. release date. So this, that's the one that's announcing. And then the one on the fifth yep. is the, is the very chatty. chatty. <laughs> yes. Oh, that is uh, fantastic. So in terms of, you go to a lot of different events. Uh, you've taken uh, Tammy's course. You've talked about um, business master classes and stuff like that. What's your ratio, uh, especially because you're, you're helping other writers with the business of writing, what's your ratio between creative and, and business? How do, you, how do you balance those things out? 
You mean in terms of the writing or in terms of attending? Well, I, to, one, first in terms of writing, but then attending, because I do know that uh, when you've been at events that you've actually been actively writing while at events, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I'm crazy. Um, in terms of writing, uh, we are aiming for four business books a year. Okay. All right. So they, they come out basically once a quarter. Okay. Uh, is, is, well, they come out once a quarter. I have to write two a year. Blaze writes two a year. Okay. So you split that up. So, <laughs> so it's, it's half a, so I, I have something that I have to get out sometime Q1, Q2 this year, and that's going to be Arthur, author branding. Okay. All righty. Excellent. And, and so that's how I, that's how I do the, the business things. Uh, I write a lot of blog posts. Okay. And so if anybody follows my blog or follows me on Facebook, they'll get a lot of writing process and some business stuff there. Uh, a lot of life coach there too. Uh, now in terms of, of going to events, it really depends on the year, how many yeah. events we're going to attend. This year, I went to the science fiction workshop, uh, which was in Las Vegas, which was a lot of writing because that's what you do with those craft workshops. Right. They're kind of crazy. I'll be going to Las Vegas for the licensing expo in May. Right. Uh, I'm going to um, attend uh, PNWA. I'm actually going to be on panels for PNWA, uh, which is the Pacific Northwest uh, Writers Alliance, um, which is in September. And then in November, I'll be at Oricon. And I don't know what else we'll do in between those times, except CampCon. We have a group of writers that we hang out with who also like to go camping. It's just you have your own camp con? <laughs> so we have our own camp con. Okay. So a group of us get together and we go camp someplace where we have electricity. For so your laptop. this is drive-in okay. camping. All right. Yeah, someplace that has electricity. And so this is drive-in camping and you can, and we have tables with uh, um, covered, um, like awnings or something. Or, awnings yeah. and things that we, that we bring. And one side is where you go and you sit and you write and you create and you had better be quiet on that side. And then there's frequently a second campsite that's set up that's for socialization, where you go and you socialize and you chat and, and things like that. And that's wow. generally where we all have our meals together. Uh, but you, and you walk back and forth between the two. Oh, wow. So it's, it's, it's a large enough space that there's a two <laughs> separate campsites or how's yep. it? Yeah, okay. Wow, that's fantastic. I love that. So um, we are uh, second month in. Uh, we're still in the mm -hmm. first quarter of 2020 as we're recording this. Yes. And you've got, I know there's a business book that uh, at least that you spoke about. That's the next one in your series, The Branding for yep. Authors. What was the latest fiction title that you just released? Uh, latest fiction title uh, that just came out was uh, Origins, Huli Intergalactic. This is hard space fantasy. Okay. So it is hard science fiction mixed with fantasy. It started with the phrase, uh, in the end, physics fails mankind. The only way to travel the great distances between the stars is by using magical portals. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there, you, <laughs> there you've, you've, you've got nerds on both sides of the spectrum excited, right? You've got the <laughs> Exactly. Okay. And then the physicists are going to be arguing with the <laughs> fantasists. Exactly. Is that what you call them? <laughs> uh, yeah, and so it's that weird intersection between physics and fantasy. And so Origins is the start of the intergalactic uh, stuff, and it's how do they start building these portals, because they're a different type of portal than, it, than a wizard is generally used to, to create. And they have to work with some sort of physical physics and, and like that. And so it's, it's all about how do we find this magic? How do we find the physics? How do we, how do we um, discover the mathematics and the equations that go with it? And then the test pilots who have to start going through this or what kind of shielding do we need on their ships? And what kind of energy source can we use? And just, it, it's hard science fantasy. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I want to thank you for hanging out with me, sharing some stories with me, sharing some business uh, as well. Where can people find out more about you? Check out your newsletters, check out uh, your different books and different projects you're working on. So my website is leahcutter.com, L-E-A-H-C-U-T-T-E-R.com. 
and that's where my blog is. You can sign up for the newsletter. Everything is, is right there. And uh, you can also find me on Facebook. I think it's Facebook slash Leah dash cutter. Yeah. Those are the two primary places. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. Those just, uh, that's not who I am. I am a person of words, not a person of pictures. Ah, perfect. Well, thank you, Leah, for spending the time with me, sharing some words of wisdom with, uh, with my listeners. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. One of the things I really love is I love the way, I love Leah's approach. I love, I mean, you, you look at the profile picture of her that, that we used in this episode at starkreflections.ca. She's got this amazing laugh. She's got this wonderful smile. She's got this upbeat attitude that she brings. That's why I love chatting with her, whether it's in person or even if it's just a video chat like we had. And that energy is something that she just conveys right into her writing, right into her fiction, right into the things that she does. And she conveys that same sort of energy and fun and spirit in her author newsletter. And I love that she has the two different versions of the newsletter. She has, you know, the, the one where she has the monthly release, the 30 day release that she's been f working on for years. And she's been dedicated this for a long, long term. That's something else to reflect on that she isn't just thinking of something in the short term. But this is something that she believes in she's passionate about and she's passionate about so many different genres and so many different styles of writing. But she's also passionate about talking about what she's reading and talking about the, the, the creative process and all those things. And I love that she has the chatty newsletter as well as the one where she talks about the new releases. And that's kind of a really, really important thing to pause and reflect on because people will sign up for a newsletter maybe to get something for free initially, maybe because they, they like someone or they like an author and they go, oh, I can get access to this other content that I can't get otherwise or it's special content or whatever, but I can also feel connected to the writer because... And I love the fact that she just calls it the chatty uh, newsletter. And I think the other one's the, the less chatty newsletter. But it's just fascinating because you got to remember, nobody wants to be sold to. Nobody wakes up and says, oh, my God, I hope an author tries to sell me a book today. No, on the converse, I hope I have really good conversations and interesting conversations and, and, and do interesting things and meet interesting people or talk to people who are interesting and out of that, I may find things that I'm passionate about and passionate to do. Uh, I'm also uh, currently reading uh, Adam Croft's book on writing killer blurbs and hooks. And, and he also made a very similar point in that is that, you know, uh, the, the overly salesly uh, copy was like, you must buy this book today. Uh, and, and Adam likes to scale it back as well, even in, in the blurbs that he writes up is, uh, well, they're on the item page for Amazon or some other retailer. They're going to decide whether they're going to buy on their own volition. Let's give them reason to want to buy. Let's motivate them to want to have to read the next thing, the next line, or actually click the buy button so they have to read this book. And that's sort of the same thing that you're doing when, when you look at Leah's uh, newsletter, is she's just sharing, she's giving, she's having a fun time, and there will be people who are so compelled to want to read more of her and her voice and all of the great things she's up to that those are the people, those are the diehard fans that are going to go on and say, I really like Leah. It's too bad I only hear this from her once a month with this chatty newsletter. I know a way I can get more Leah. I can go and I can purchase some of her stuff. That's just something that I reflected on after this conversation with Leah. What did you reflect on from this conversation with Leah or from this episode in general? You can leave your comments over at starkreflections.ca. And thanks so much to those of you who do take the time to leave the comments. And I understand it's kind of hard because I often listen to podcasts while I'm driving or while I'm taking a run. And it's very, very difficult to leave comments. I, I often reflect on how many I want to leave and don't often get a chance to do that. But thank you to those who do end up uh, leaving a comment. I do know that there's probably more people who aren't able to but have thought about it. It's too bad we haven't uh, connected our minds to technology in that way. But don't worry, it's coming. It's probably coming. In any case, thank you so much for listening to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I will be coming at you again next week. And next week's interview is going to be an interview with John Hargrave, Sir John Hargrave. We're going to be talking about his book, Blockchain for Everyone. But don't be scared. It sounds like it could be scary blockchain, but it's actually funny and it's humorous. And there's a lot of fascinating things that John talks about, as well as reinventing yourself. So that'll be coming up in episode 121. And so until next week and episode 121, 
Here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. Thank you.